Shepard's uh, got some nice design going on. So we're in the redeveloped Union Station. The um, furniture is out of control, as you can see. Stunning. And this is totally public. Uh, Wi-Fi everywhere. There's uh, games, there's cafe, there's restaurants, there's bars. It's kind of, um, this is what we talk about when we talk about the Commonwealth, that um, if you offer the you know, lower, middle, upper classes equality and uh, respect, then society gets safer and better immediately, less crime and all that. It's awesome. It's the potential of redevelopment right here. So Rachel has accomplished the impossible. She got Waylon into Denver, out of Boulder. And Denver, one of the hottest cities in the US right now. For about a decade, it's been, watch out for glass, glass, glass. One of the um, hottest cities in the US, or the hottest city for singles, music, stuff like that. But now it's, uh, there's been so much creative development. Uh, eco-responsible, creative, inspiring, community-focused, and some affordable development that it's really kind of just taken off. It's almost like the new Brooklyn. So this is a great uh, example, the source of taking a neighborhood that's pretty nasty in a lot of ways. No bike paths, no even like roads. The roads are all potholed and uh, Rachel and I just nearly got run over by semi-trucks and biked through like dilapidated crappy fields of random sh stuff and um, and then suddenly we're here and there's like restaurants and whatever and it's safe and people are bicycling and yeah you could say it's all hipster la 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 but basically they're making a community safe and fun for families and arts and uh, that's awesome the danger on the other side is that um, you know it gets aspenized it gets it becomes just for the rich and not accessible welcome to the source So you all have heard of the self-hating Jew, Larry David is one of the stars. There's also the self-hating hipster. We're in the epicenter of hipsterdom in Denver. And the first sign we see says, no hipsters. Kyle and Andra Zeppelin, Kyle and Andra Zeppelin, and we're going to go over five fundamental elements to a vibrant, vital, fun, eco-responsible, accessible community. So, hit us. Either. Well, I think we'll start with the walkability and bikeability. Um, the ability to go get a cup of coffee in the morning where you don't go to the Starbucks drive through where right. you, know, you, you walk and you get a cup of coffee and then you go on about your day, hopefully walk or bike to work. So it's healthy and it's easy and you don't have to get in your little bubble of your car to do it necessarily. And it promotes interaction with people. Um, right. Yeah. 
Well, so much of it's about all the things that happen along the way that aren't right. exactly. totally predictable, that you're not just going from point A to point B. Right. And what makes a good bike lane? It's not just putting a strip down, although that's down a good Down the start. middle of the road? Yeah. And calling it a bike lane? That yeah. Definitely like keeping it safe, lane. separate, ideally. In our case, we basically uh, pleaded for a bike lane and fought and argued about it. And what in this Rhino area? Yeah. Uh -huh. Out directly out front of the source on Brighton Boulevard. So new infrastructure, new neighborhood. So you were getting it? And so we were told no all the way up until the 12th hour when they oh. finally relented after four or five public meetings when some bike activists, along with all the neighborhood people, really converged on the meetings wow. and affected the outcome. But we were told no all the way up until the last possible moment. When they well, so that's a fundamental thing, which we actually didn't have on our little list, which is Activism, community engagement. Community engagement. Yeah. Let's talk about, um, you know, the since we're already kind of on it, the work, live, multiple use. What, what do you call that? Mixed use. Mixed use. Yeah. It's just, it, what it does is it creates activity in a space throughout the day. So um, you have your office here, you have a cafe here, you have a wine shop here or something. And you can bike from your home, maybe your home. And we can all here. be in the same, on the same block. Right. And we'll be okay. And we'll right. probably be it's better off fun. as a community. Yeah. Yeah. And you save an hour or whatever on either end of the community, which is huge. Huge. For exercise, for stress. Right. Maybe we could talk about density and accessibility. Yeah, I mean, the uh, amount of people that you get in a city, it gives you the critical mass to support some of these functions and have businesses succeed at a high level. And when things get too disjointed and spread out, um, to do anything really innovative that's on the edge, you just don't have an audience to be able to support that. Uh, so that's a lot of what's creating the opportunity at the source and uh, throughout all the projects. And you know, I think most people have traveled to major cities and are affected by how dynamic they are. And a lot of that has to do with just having maximum population density in a place. The deficiencies that, that come out of density. And the, the ability for everyone to walk to their gym and not bike to it, to not drive to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know it's ironic well, in Boulder with these great like recreation you, you centers. Dri you drive and everyone you get drives. To, you try to get the closest parking spots. Yeah, exactly. Too. And then you get on a bike, right? You get on an auto yeah. bike that's plugged in using electricity, coal, but you drive to go bike. It's, it's fun. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we often think that cities are not eco because you don't see a lot of nature, but you know, having a lot of people live together, like friends of ours in New York, we all have friends who never learned to drive when they grew up there, and um, you know, it's more eco in terms of heating and cooling and oh, definitely. interaction. Yeah. There's a huge connection with with the city and rural places and being able to preserve that quality of life in each place, and to be able to have cities that are dense and active and provide a unique urban experience, actually it becomes a buffer to sprawl that you don't have to just keep building the city out further and further. What is the role of food, or real food, or local food in uh, creating a vibrant community? Food is the universal thing, right? We all eat. Most of us like nice things to eat. We're drawn to it. It's it's an yeah. experience we share. It doesn't matter where you come from, who you are, what ethnicity you are, what race you are, what your background, economic background, background is. Just a unifier, food, right? Yeah. Um, and people have, I think, actually, people of lower incomes have more of an ability to appreciate cooking from scratch because it's the way they, their affluence didn't allow them to switch to, you know, I don't know microwave dinners, yeah. um, but it's, it's making a comeback because well, people are gathering around artisans and organic and local. And, and it's obviously fun generally, eating it's fun. with people. And it's, it supports community. Yeah. Well, it's also unique to the place. So each region has its own strengths uh, or culture in that way. It's contextual. I think it's, that's the, they put, we love fish. For example, but uh, a fish-centric restaurant in Denver still does not make a lot of sense for us. No matter how fresh 
Right. You, you fly it in from wherever you fly it in. Unless it's like trout or something. Unless it's fish. trout, which is what we which is what we cook yeah. at home. But it's not contextual. It doesn't feel. It feels right. like eating watermelon in December. Yeah. You know, there's a we go to the Northwest and it's awesome to eat salmon because it's there and it's it yeah. feels like it's part of the place. It's got yeah. it's got roots in the place that it's in. Yeah. People think like sushi drives me nuts because. In Boulder, like people think sushi is fresh and raw, but really it's like caught, frozen, often ships are flown to right. Japan where it's cubed up or whatever. Right. And then someone was telling me about it, and then flown back in packed in ice. And, and then there's styrofoam in the alley, right. and then you're served this fresh, raw. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, you know, I think that's the part of that is no matter how fresh you can actually get something. Does it, it just doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't feel good to eat it out of context to me. Maybe I'm just more connected to yeah. that kind of stuff. But well, like for lunch, we just had, you know, fresh peaches from the Western Slope. Right. It's nice. Yeah, it's in season. There was great anticipation to me as a child growing up when the new season of something came, of strawberries, and they tasted differently. And it's gone now. Yeah. You can buy me around it. Yeah, well, thank you with the eater and with uh, uh, everything. What do you call the whole thing? Yeah, it's up on the Valman. Yeah, the source, taxi. The source specifically, taxi. Thank you um, for having us. Yeah, thanks for helping reignite uh, what we Buddhists would call enlightened society. Appreciate it. It's fun. Thanks. All right, Kyle, Andre, thank you.